Well, hi there, everybody. This is the Lawrence History Project. I'm your host, Mark Palermo, and my co-host, Tom Delisle, with me today. We're going to take another peek at yesteryear, look at where we came from, where we are, where we're going, and uh, just want to thank the people at uh, HC Media. A fantastic job, fantastic people to work with, and the Lawrence Archives for their assistance in, uh, in providing a lot of these photos. Well, uh, Tom, uh, what do you think? You ready? Yeah, ready to go. This is Tom Delisle. I, you know, I haven't, I, haven't dis I haven't figured out, or we haven't figured out if he's a co-host or he's a guest, but he's been with me through six, six permutations of the Lawrence History Project. So welcome as a co-host, Tom. I think we're going to call you a co-host. Co-host. We, we yeah. haven't defined it very well, but that's it. the way it worked out. Mm -hmm. so, we're making uh, it up as we go along. That's right. Now, Tom, just a word about Tom. Tom is a master photographer. I've been taking photographs of Lawrence since the 1950s. And as you can see, we're not young, sprite kids anymore. So this, is, this stuff is going back 60 years, 65 years or more. And we know the stories, and we're gonna tell you the stories behind a lot of this stuff too. Not just the pictures, but the stories too. So, without further ado, Cassie, could we have the first picture, please? Well, Again, we, we ended with Bill Peters and we're starting with Bill Peters. Some of Lawrence's finest here. Um, a few other guys are watching the game. I'm not sure, you know, what what sports team it was. It but looks like it looks like now this is probably the early eighties, seventies. That 80s? was uh, yeah, late probably late seventies. This looks like a real what they call the men's bar. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you don't see many men's bars anymore. It's politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. But in those days, of course, women women could go to bars. But there were certain bars that were men's bars. Um, and uh, Bill Peters was, it's almost a caricature nowadays to look at it. But, um, but uh, it was, looks like a 1930s bar that they never, ever put any money into fixing up. It just looks the way it always looked. It looked, and mm -hmm. you know, nowadays, there's a lot of movie theaters, uh, movie productions in Lawrence because they come to Lawrence because they can get shots of older buildings and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and place their movies in the proper time. But it's too bad they didn't keep Bill Peters just for movie production because that is the most amazing place of, of, of a 1930s bar I think I can ever imagine. This Bill Peters. It is. And they, they did have uh, rooms upstairs that uh, people lived in. It was yeah. a bit of a rooming house, too. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was, Scorsese would have loved that. Oh, An yeah. instant set, you know, Fellini, Scorsese, anybody. Fellini. Imagine Fellini doing a picture in there. Yeah. Wow. Bill Peters Cafe. A real dive bar. Dive bar. If there ever was one. And you know, they, it's funny, it's right by the factory gates. So guys would come out of the factory. Mm -hmm. That that must have been his clientele. Right. Guys would come right out of the factory, just a block away, mm -hmm. and there you are. You're in Bill Peters. And cheap beer. It was really cheap. It was like in the '70s. I think it was a quarter for for a, a glass of beer, and uh, I mean, really, for a couple of bucks, you can get tanked up pretty well before you go home. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cassie, can we have the next one, please? Uh, who's this gentleman? This is uh, Freddie. I forget Freddie's last name. I worked with him at, um, in dietary at the Lawrence General. This is opposite. It looks like what? Cigarette? No, what is that? Something's Cigarettes, 46. 46, 46 cents, cents for cigarettes. Could it, be, could it be? It could be 46 cents because when I was a kid, I mean like, you know, 10 years old, back in 1960, my grandfather would send me down to Lawless Drugstore for a king size package of Newport cigarettes, and they were twenty eight cents. Twenty eight. Twenty eight cents. So this is almost almost a two thirds jump. But that was right across from the place that the Hayden Schofield, uh, right on the corner of Lawrence Street and um, was it Fitz Fitz Street? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it, it was Conrad Lawrence and Fritz. And um, yeah, I worked with Freddie for years, and I happened to see him out there. He retired by then, but he was a true character. Oh, true was character, yeah. you know. Old, was that, you know. Was that his store? It wasn't his store. I think oh. he lived around there. Yeah, yeah. And as a kid, you know, he he was older when when we worked at the General. Me and again, Manny Bagday, and his name comes up. He was the wood player, and it always called you dirty rats, you dirty rats, you dirty rats. <laughs> but it was a sign of affection. If Freddie called you a dirty rat, then you were okay. You're okay. You were a okay, dirty with rat. Freddie. Yeah. But those games at the the place that the softball oh, games. Yeah. That was the story from that area. Um, hundred guy, hundred people, maybe two hundred people a night would show up for those games, follow their teams. Um, Hall of Hands, Sycamore Club. There were more that I, I can't remember the names of. And uh, yeah, I, I remember um, there was a Eddie Fainer. Remember Eddie? Eddie Fainer. He would yeah. uh, this guy Eddie Fainer. He would um, he would pitch strikes from uh, he would he would pitch from second base. Second base. And strike mm-hmm. everybody out. Nobody could touch this guy. Right. He, they do all kinds of tricks. Uh, amazing guy, Eddie. I forgot Eddie that Fainer. name. Eddie yes. Fainer. he would come every year to Lawrence as a, a softball exhibit. I think he had like three or four guys, and they would play a full team. Mm-hmm. And, right, uh, right. Because no one them. could hit him. Nobody could touch him. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And there was a woman's softball team, and she—I forget her name. But she pitched from the pitcher's mound. No one could hit her either. Yeah, there was one. They were blow by like struck, a fastball. Struck out uh, Babe Ruth. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if he had a hangover that day or yeah. whatever, but he was, wasn't very happy about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the Lawrence Playstead. That was Place a that. that was a place to go after work if you wanted to go out for a walk. You go to the Lawrence Place. It's still there. I think they still play softball. Oh, they do. They? It, yeah. It's active yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you know some of the some of the plays. You'd say they're inconsistent because they weren't professionals, but some of the plays. You'd see it. It looked like professional diving catches and, and double plays and stuff. They're amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, some the, the skill level of some of these guys. Lawrence Place dead. Yeah, and all the stores around there. Um, Charms Variety. Oh yeah. Charm and his two daughters. Um, that was right across the street because one time my friend Sal and I, Joe, there was there was a man Joe. He used to go around with a cigar box, shaking a cigar box that people would throw in literally nickels and dimes and maybe a quarter. Was he a, was he handicapped? He, I think he, he was he, he was deaf and I think he was oh, mute. I also. remember him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. deaf mute. Uh, yes. Joe. Yeah, everybody and knew him. Everybody yeah. knew Joe. Yeah. And one night, Sal and I, we did the scoreboard again. We were kids, maybe twelve, yeah. and they stored the numbers. The, there was a ladder. You'd go up to the the scoreboard right right by the spigot. And all the numbers were there, yeah. and only one right by Tom's Variety. He'd, he'd have the lock. That was, that was big. Again, if, if Freddie called you a dirty rat, and if you did the scoreboard one time, that's as good that as high got. That, yeah. that was high status. No electronic scoreboards in those days, huh? No, no. It you was a box with the numbers, and you get up punks, on the ladder, you know, and... putting the <laughs> putting the numbers up. <laughs> I did that great. a couple. I did that once, mm-hmm. and I, I got bored in the middle. of It was a long inning. Oh yeah, and I put the wrong number, and they they, they all started yelling at me. They start- <laughs> <laughs> Pay That's attention, God damn it! Pay yeah. attention. Attention. <laughs> <laughs> and what else we have? Can we have the next one, please, Cassie. Oh well, if we could, Clark's br- station Clark break. Clark's station break. And the elegant. Mm-hmm. President Hotel. Yes. A lot of stories there. A lot of stories. If those bricks could talk, I'm sure. You know, look at the elegant um, brickwork on the that. brickwork. Mm-hmm. Back in its day, that was probably a really high-class place. Mm-hmm. I remember the, the, the lobby was, was marble. They had marble, marble all over the yeah. lobby. Marble. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had a friend of mine. Uh, Dave used to work for the electric company back in the early 70s and Dave was telling me he went in there to read the electric meter went downstairs and in the basement he said it's the weirdest thing he says they have a whole speakeasy down there they did. like a 1920s wow. speakeasy Whoa. and may, probably not there anymore but he said it just freaked me out he said I could just see you know I could just imagine mm-hmm. you know Illegal liquor. Of course, Lawrence, you know, Lawrence, I, I used to talk to these old timers, and they told me, oh, Lawrence was a center of illegal liquor. 
Mm-hmm. He's come here from New York and uh, shipping Canadian whiskey down here. This was a center. Center. Of, a hub. What is the, yeah. What is, uh, what is the French? Plus la change, plus la mom shows. The, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> yeah. <Lawrence. laughs> My father used to always well, we say Lawrence was known for three things, bar rooms, gas stations, and banks. Bar rooms, gas, gas stations, stations, and, and banks. banks. Isn't that interesting? Um, yeah. And I know that the building going up now behind the Immigrant City Archives is another bank. Yeah. Right yeah, where yeah. by um, Levy, you know, the mm-hmm. paper company, right by the Duck Bridge. Um, so maybe it's still going I, on. I would add probably, if you go back to the 20s, movie theaters too. I saw, Mo- I was oh, yeah. just doing a little research on this. And I saw, a, um, I saw a list of movie theaters from the early 20s. And I counted 30 movie Whoa. theaters in Lawrence. Some of them are not big, the, like the Palace or the Broadway. Those mm-hmm. are like movie theaters that you would expect to see in Boston. Right. But they have a lot of smaller neighborhood theaters, mm-hmm. such as the Central Theater. Central. Uh, a lot of others, the Star. I remember the Star? And the Star, yeah. Yeah, that was... The, the, the Star the, was unforgettable. The uh, the Star, I think, was a dime. But the the, the Palace... Well, the, wait a minute. Was it a dime or a quarter? So, the, the palace was fifty cents when you were a kid. Yeah, um, but the but the star was, I think, a dime I or remember, a quarter. I think a, a, I remember a quarter. A quarter, yeah. And so the if you premier didn't have, that was right next to Clark's. The, what? the, the, the premier on Essex oh, Street, yeah, another small one, right next to premier. Yeah, that yeah. was um, yeah, yeah, Clark Station break. Right, yeah, just to the left of that, that maybe was even the footprint of where yeah. the premier was, possibly. So the President Hotel, yeah, it's still there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there were a lot of traveling vaudeville players used to come through Lawrence because uh, vaudeville was, if they had a lot, since they had a lot of theaters, you know, when you go to a theater in those days, a movie, you dressed up and it was, entire, it was an evening. Mm-hmm. Not only did you see a movie, you saw a newsreel and you saw some vaudeville performers. Mm-hmm. And this, this system continued right up until about World War II and then it gave way. But um, you can see acrobats, uh, uh, anything, anything, musical shows, anything, mm-hmm. vaudeville performers, and they would go from town to town, and they used to come through Lowell and Lawrence as mm-hmm. well. I'll bet you that was a probably for vaudeville performers. Who knows? But Lawrence was a very popular, very popular, and very prosperous town back in the twenties. That it was. Okay, the next one, please. Well, that's from inside the Lido again. Few, now look at the style. Few of the boys, yeah. Look at the style there. Sort of a Frank Sinatra. Dapper. Exactly. Dapper is the word. Dapper. 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 You know, in, in the old the old timers, yeah, you, you know, I'm from Italian descent myself. The old timers, if you, you, if you talk with them, you know dignity is very important. Even if you don't have two cents to rub together, you can dress well. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and that man, I just like the style, the dapper look. The just well trimmed look, and that man I remember looking at it now, and this hadn't occurred to me. I looked at this picture many times. There was a shot from the Carmen. We'll probably get to it eventually. Of mm-hmm. four men, four friends sitting on a bench. One. I know the one you mean. Over the course, two different years, the same four guys, and this man was dressed up. He must have dressed up every day, yeah. like this, to, to go to the Carmen, or to just hang out with his homeboys at the barber shop. But there was um, a sense of dignity, it, it, you know, was, that you yeah. don't have nowadays. And you know, when you're well dressed, even if you have trouble, I find, even if you have troubles, you're going through a troubled time in your life. If you dress, if you dress up, you feel better about yourself. You do. You act better, and you're more confident with mm-hmm. people. So it isn't just to be vain. It, it, uh, you'll see people in nursing homes. You know, women will have their hair done. Mm-hmm. You know, at the first glance, you might say, well, she's in a nursing home. What does she want to have her hair done? She's not going dancing. But you know what? She feels better exactly. about herself. She feels pretty. Mm-hmm. She feels she feels outgoing. She, fe- you know, it, it just it makes you feel better. I think I'm going to make a prediction that elegance and class are going to come back into style someday. Mm-hmm. They've been out of style for so long. But they will be coming back, just like everything else. Like everything else. Elegance, class. Mm-hmm. We've seen the bottom. I think we've hit the bottom. Styles, we have, yeah. Behavior. In the 70s, the hair, you know, everybody had that, the, the long hair. And now, again, with the barbershops, people looking neat, almost like they did in the 50s. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they're um, taking a little pride in their 
they're a parent. If you live long enough, as we have, I think you start to see that life does indeed run in cycles. Mm -hmm. Okay, could we have the next one, please, Cassie? I'm fascinated with this. Yes, this was... Now, this um, is one of your pictures? One of mine from... Um, typical Tom <laughs> picture. She's smiling. She looks so proud of herself. So, she feels so pretty. She was, yes, this is one of the few South Lawrence shots I have. This was on July 4th, 1976, 200th anniversary. Oh, uh, yes. And it was... It might have been a political place because I see all the flags up. I forget what it was. But there was no one around in South Lawrence. There was something going on. I don't know, don't know if there was a parade. No, this was the day. That's right. This was the day. It was about 96 degrees. And everyone was going to the beach. Lawrence was a ghost town. And that's right. I remember this. I had to work 3 to 11 at the, with the Bon Secours when it was the Bon Secours. So I was going to treat myself because my whole family was at the beach and I had to work. So I went to Bishop's of all places. And I had Bishop's to myself, if you could believe that. I was the only person in Bishop's for the businessman's lunch. And I had three waitresses. They were all, you know, spoiling me because I was the only one making a big deal out of it. <laughs> and then after the meal, I had a little time before 3 o'clock when the shift started. So I went over to South Lawrence, and I got a shot of that lady. And here, here it is now, all, all these years, years all later. All these years later. Mm -hmm. Let's see, 1976, 24 plus, well, 24 plus 22. Plus 22, this is 46 years. 46 years, years ago. She's probably about 40 years old there. Yeah, probably. Oh, she's mm -hmm. pretty, well, nobody getting any younger here, Tom. No. <laughs> God bless her. God bless her. <laughs> okay, the next one, please. Bongi's Market. Yeah. Bongi's. I think this is, I have a few shots of Bongi's, but I think this is from the archives. Oh, the yes. City Archives. Yeah, Bon Jesus was a landmark on Quammen Street. You know, in the 50s, my father used to go in there, and they used to have some kind of pickled radishes. And they're in a big oak barrel. When you, when you, when you buy, like, olives from Bonji, mm -hmm. whether it's olives or pickled radishes or whatever, it's pickles, you don't get them prepackaged. He, he has a ladle. He goes to a big wooden oak barrel. Mm-hmm and scoops them out with a ladle, and then he puts them into a, a container for you. Mm -hmm. There's no prepackaged stuff in there. No. But uh, remember, they were called chubalinis, chubalinis. Oh, and they were addictive. You couldn't stop eating chubalinis. once you, once you started eat, start eating these chubalinis. And uh, they're really delicious. Mm -hmm. I can't track them down. I've talked to old people and never heard of it. It must be some kind of regional... Uh, dialect or something, but they were pickled radishes in brine. Oh, mm -hmm. it was just so good. Mm -hmm. And the olives and olives and stuff. Something about brine and an oak barrel. It imparts a nice flavor. Old world. Yeah, yeah it's old it world. was really old world. And he sold. He used to sell. You know, notice in the in the window he had malukis. But yes, yep. Malukis is mal evil. Okio is the eye. I. Evil eye. It was these little horns, these little pepper-like things mm -hmm. you put around you, to, and it would protect you from being from Keep curses. Yep. Curses. I have a yeah. shot of those mm -hmm. in one of the window shots from Bongi's. And in, in Greece, they do the same thing. A lot, a lot of European countries. A you lot know, of European Mediterranean countries. countries. Oh yeah, it's surprising how yeah. ubiquitous that that practice is. It is. And if you have blue eyes, mm -hmm. I was walking in, in Corfu on the island of Corfu. And um, an old lady came by, and she would she spit on the sidewalk. And I happened to be going by a store where a woman, English woman, had moved there. I lived there 20 years, and she had these unbelievable blue-green eyes. And she said they used to do that until they got to know her. Because when you see those, um, like the discs, they're always like white and blue. And they thought people with the blue eyes, they could give you the evil eye. And a lot of times when you see that there, that, hmm. That's the reason they're those colors. Superstition. Superstition. But who knows? Maybe there is something to evil prayers. Mm -hmm. We have prayers for good. We have curses for bad. Uh, 
who knows where that came from, but it's really surprising how, how ubiquitous that is, not just in Southern, uh, even in other cultures. I think even in Asia, mm -hmm. they have similar practices. Protect you from the evil eye. But he had them all. He had a, he quite a selection of them in there. Mm -hmm. He had clay pipes, he had enormous clay pipes. I don't remember like those. That. I oh, remember yeah? those. I bought one one time, mm -hmm. smoking the thing. It's, it does, the, the, the large size cools the smoke. Right. That's what it serves you, to, it helps you to do. Okay, the next one, please. The Bongis. It's an interesting character. Did you take this? Or is this yeah, a, this was one. And I, again, I wish I had taken so many more. The Palace on the Broadway. This was um, it would have been maybe nice a few weeks, literally, oh, before yeah. they started to, to knock him down. That, that's, is that the palace? Or is that the I, broad, You know, I always get confused. I think, that, I think that's the Broadway. I and think, the one next to it is the Strand. Is it? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Oh, yeah. But anyway. So they would have knocked down a th the third one. There were, there were three in a row there when we were growing up. I, think I don't so. think it was I, the strand there when we were growing yeah, up. Yeah, I think that I think the the palace was the last one to go, mm -hmm. and that was 1976. And of course, the Warner that was the other side that was the other side of Broadway. The Warner right. lasted up until um, mid 19 about 1984, I think. Mm -hmm. By that time, they should have known to keep one of them at least, but um, no foresight. They didn't have the no, foresight. No, they just did. they just didn't have it. That's too bad. Of course, you know, heating the place. They would have had to get a massive grant, mm -hmm. and nobody had the, apparently had the will to do that. Just heating the place with a high ceiling and stuff, it would have been quite a chore. But they do that in places. They do that in places. If that were Boston, they wouldn't have even thought of, I don't know, Boston or Cambridge. I think they would have saved it. But it's too late. The Warner in particular, they had uh, opera chairs, opera seating. Oh, you know, yeah. What do they call Opera seats. And uh, balusters and carved gar gargoyles. Oh my god! Oh, it, it was elegant. It there were so some elegant. shots from the archives. We, we'll show sometime. Oh, some I'd love black. to see those. Yeah, they yeah. were. Mag it was magnificent. It was magnificent. Yeah, I'd forgotten yeah. how ornate it had been. Yeah, but you know, all over the world. I mean, you have something beautiful, but you know, everything reverts to the mean. It takes money and energy to keep the thing going. I, I look on YouTube and some of the um, castles and mansions. Uh, in Europe and even in this country, unbelievable, and they get abandoned, mm -hmm. and nobody wants to take them over because of the upkeep. Right. So imagine you have a castle, and the upkeep on a castle, the taxes, the upkeep, it's just abandon them, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're works of art. It would take it would take many millions of dollars to restore them. It doesn't take long for them to fall into ruins. So sometimes that just happens. Okay. Next, please, Cassie. Well, I know this one well. Yep. This you you should talk old, about this one. Oh, yeah. The old Burke Hospital. I was a uh, boiler fireman and night watchman here for a couple of years in the nineteen late 1970s. And um, it's a long history for the Burke Hospital. It was originally a um, poorhouse, poorhouse type. Of, in the old days, back in the uh, 19th century, they had poorhouses. And uh, when you had nowhere else to go, and you're old, and you just you just can't help yourself, they pick you up off the street and they bring you in here. And I find an old I found an old book, an old register, in there one day, and uh, it had an elegant writing. Now you talk about the DSM. How many different categ categories are there in the DSM? Hundreds, maybe. Oh, they had absolutely. They had a, it was a register for people that were picked up. Mostly guys, mostly men. They picked up off the street, and the categories were drunken, imbecile, moron, idiot, and something else. So the the, the words drunken, moron, idiots were uh, well, they weren't just insults. They were actually they described uh, different levels of mental retardation. I don't know which one the highest one was, but drunkard, idiot, moron, imbecile. And there's another one, indigent or something, mm -hmm. meaning like totally, you know, burned out. Um, they had people who used to drink themselves to death or drink them. Or during the Depression, mm -hmm. people would drink uh, like uh, wood alcohol or auto automobile um, antifreeze. Mm -hmm. 
and they'd get like half brain dead, they'd bring him to the Burke. And so it was a mission. Um, it was a great mission, and they get really good care. The problem was, in around 19, in the 1970s, it became the, um, I think it was the only city-owned hospital. Or it became a nursing home. That's what it did. It the was end. a nursing it, home it was at a, the end. It became the yeah. only mm -hmm. city-owned nursing home in the state. And, of course, the city cannot administer a nursing home like a private company can. It's too much patronage. It got too expensive. So Mayor Buckley shut it down. And a lot of people that were in there, they got shipped out and they died. Uh, broken heart. You know, they're just separated. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of people that fought that tooth and nail. They're still mad about it today. Uh, what happened because you're really dedicated to the Burke and uh, it's too bad what happened but uh, it did in 1976 it shut down but it went on for a few more years the, the, there was such a raging battle to reopen it that they had to keep it heated and that's where I came in I was just trying to get through college and I had a boiler fireman's license so they hired me as a combination boiler fireman and night watchman and uh I was able to get through college with that job. And then if they did finally tear it down about early, about 1982 or 83. They just got rid of it. They waited a the Most of the opposition died off. And then uh, they did it. They did the deed. Can we have the next one, please, Cassie. Well, this goes without saying. Yeah. Classic Lawrence establishment. Cedar Crest Diner. Nice photo. The, Did you take that photo? Yeah, 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 I took that one. Yeah, I never thought I'd see that place empty, but we had my mother's 80th birthday party over there on, really? on, on the dark side, the classy side, and we huh. ended up closing the place because it was around 9 o'clock at night, and I remember um, Mary Claire Kennedy and um, Eddie, the waiter who'd been there 28 years, they were there. I got a couple of shots of them, but I said, Mary Clay, can I get a shot of this counter? Completely empty. So that was a one-off. I was in the right place at the right time. Everybody has great stories and memories about the Cedar Crest, the, the diner side or the, the dock side. Yeah, uh, and they was, called it the Cedar Crest because the walls inside, the inside it, it was divided in two. That was, what you saw was the informal diner, lunch cart type thing. Uh, and the other part was a more elegant restaurant for if you wanted to have a formal meal with your family or something. And it, and it was all cedar wood. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, it the smelled, benches. Like, it smelled yeah. of cedar. It's mm -hmm. gorgeous. Really nice. Yeah. Um, my father used to go in there a lot when he used to work at the old gas company. And in the 70s, Jackie Kennedy used to go there a lot. Right. And uh, because her son, John was a high school student at Phillips Academy right down the road, about three miles down the road. So she would stop in there. He'd tell me you should stop in there all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wasn't a very photogenic woman, but uh, he told me she's very, really attractive. She just kind of a certain glow about her. She's very friendly. She wasn't mm -hmm. stuck up. Mm -hmm. The word was she was a good tipper. Yeah. And uh, she's come there frequently. You should see her all the time. But he told me, he said, she's really... Doesn't photograph well, but she's a very attractive woman, Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, she's been gone a long time, huh? She died, I think, in the 90s. She has. Yeah. And uh, Kennedy, the son, he died in 1999. I think he was 40 years old. Remember the uh, the uh, plane accident? The plane, yeah. 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 First, it's kind of suspicious. I don't think they ever get to the bottom of that. Some unanswered questions there. Okay, next, please. Is this yours or that's, is this? That's one of mine. Yeah, another classic establishment that's being repurposed, the old Fallons. Oh, Fallons. Fallons, oh, Fallons. Fallons by the Sea. <laughs> yeah, right on Canal Street. Um, I just took a shot of the new building there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Hispanic diner. A couple of weeks ago, I was down there. We'll, get, we'll have a contemporary Lawrence show at some point. Oh, yeah. This, uh, oh, yeah, a, we have. Then and that. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then and now. And um, oh yeah, everybody remembers Fallon's. And this is this is of course Yesum. It's Essum. Yesum. It's Essum. Essum were hot dogs that were made in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. They just do. They do have a distinctive flavor. I think they still make them. I they? think so. Yeah. yeah. I, I still, you can get them. You don't buy them in the refrigerated section. You got to. You actually buy them in the deli section. Mm -hmm. 
which might be good because I mean, if you're buying them in the deli section, they're probably not. I, I would think they don't have as many preservatives. But if you're eating hot dogs, do you really care about preservatives? No. Probably not. But they have a distinctive flavor. You either like them or you don't. There's no in-between. I think they, they Everett, I'm, I may be mistaken, mm-hmm. but Everett Mass, they may make SM down there now. Oh, do they? Yeah, yeah. SM. SM. Yes, SM. SM. It's SM. SM. There was a slogan we heard many times growing up. Mm-hmm. SM, it's SM. Next, please. There's Fallon's Diner. Fallon's, yeah. Another one of mine that's just opposite, over the Spicket River Bridge by the place then, again. Um, in the archives, I saw a great shot just recently, probably from the 1940s, with a bunch of guys standing out front, and it was Fallon, same building. And it's, I think it says something like, never closes, al- always open, always open. Always open. Yeah, same footprint. Um, a tea room. Tea room. I can't imagine a tea room in Fallon's. Probably that on, on the left-hand side there, uh-huh. you know, if, if you were bringing a lady in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, did he serve alcohol? I don't think so. I don't think so either. But I, as I remember, he was a real character, a really great guy. I heard stories. Oh, yeah, I don't, great, I don't know anything about him. He was a great guy, him. yeah. Mm-hmm. My father used to stop over there for lunch. My father knew him. Mm-hmm. And I, my father brought me a few times, and, and I remember he was very gregarious, very... Um, Seemed to be a really nice guy, very likable. Mm-hmm. Fallon's Diner. Open all the time. Open all the time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. It, it was right on the banks. If you, it, It's right on the banks of the Spicket River. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It was a tremendously polluted, smelly river. Mm-hmm. But if you go into Fallon's, you, you know, this is not Maison Robert. You're going in to get a hot dog and a, and a cup of coffee cup of or coffee. something. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I guess people don't mind. It's a, like a really working stiff's place, Fallon's Diner. Next, please. Uh, yes, Ripley's, believe it or not, four movie theaters in a row. There's Lawrence. And what they don't say is there's another one directly across the street. Yes. Remember, what was that called? I think that was a strand, but I may be. Oh, the Victoria? Oh, I oh, think there was no, a Victoria. Was it, Victoria was it the, the Empire? Empire. It could have been Empire. Victor- something. But it was, I it think was it pretty, was closed pretty, when we were kids. It, it was. You know, walking down Maybe. around there when I was a kid, it was like I could see, I could sense, like the energy from another era. It's like, it's like when you go in a house and you can sense ghosts. I just mm-hmm. felt like ghosts or something from it. You can tell mm-hmm. there's a lot of energy here. And by the time we were kids, television knocked them all out. Really, except for the palace. The palace managed to hang on until the seventies, but most of them were gone by the by the early by the fifties. I'm pretty gone. Mm. But it was just a, a, a feeling of history. You can sense history, not so much history of wars and revolutions, but the history of um, a great energy that was once there that is no longer there. And uh, you could sense th- an emptiness there, mm-hmm. almost a sadness at something. But everything has a beginning and an end, and it did end. But uh, fascinating. Next, please. Here it is, another picture. Another picture. This is the palace. They were built in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was reading they were... They were um, they're owned by the Warner Corporation. Oh, they were. Yeah, all of them. I think they. Uh, it was like a corporate corporate thing. Mm-hmm. So that big, that first black and white picture that we had when they were knocking them down, mm-hmm. that one on the right was the palace. The one next to it oh, was yeah. the Broadway. Oh, and yes. see in the back after the Broadway, that was oh, probably the Strand. Yeah. yeah. And whatever the fourth one was. But I remember they were, it was the Broadway and the Palace were right next to mm-hmm. each other. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine on a, a Saturday night? Because wow. in those days, everybody dressed up. This is a special occasion. Everybody. Mm-hmm. You, go to the, you go to the movie theater. It's a Saturday night. And uh, you're all dressed up with your best girl, your wife, whatever. And uh, you see a show, you know, and see a, a vaudeville show with mm-hmm. it. It's incredible. Yeah. But uh, times change. 
yeah. times change and people have different different kinds of entertainment. Nowadays, I, I think a lot of the entertainment has gone over to electronic ent entertainment. And I'd, I'd like to see, I think people still have a hunger to get out and be with other people. You see that a mm -hmm. lot, you know? So Absolutely. People want to go out. You know, I ran the uh, Lawrence Film Festival for 14 years. And it started off as a college film festival. And my wife and I originally conceived it as a, this is going to be great. College kids get out on a Saturday night. But um, it didn't work that way. It worked, but not the way we wanted it to. We thought, we were, with our, our old-fashioned thinking, we thought that kids would want to go, young people want to go out on a Saturday night, see a fi foreign film. And that we set, we set it up Saturday nights, foreign films at, at the Northern Essex Community College, free. We didn't get any. I, you, you can count on one hand uh, the number of college students. Once in a while you get one, but it was all old people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I commented to my wife one time. I said, we had a full house one time. I said, geez, we have a full house, Esther, but it looks like a adult daycare here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... The old people get it because they remember mm -hmm. this is a Saturday night. This is, and you know, we would have an intermission too in the middle so people can mingle. And, and they love that so much. They'd come back every time. And, and when, the, when the, the festival was over, they'd say, Oh, please tell me when you're going to have the next one the next year. They'd love it. You know, it's come back year after year after year. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's, a, it's a human need for community to be interacting with other people. We're not meant to just live alone, or lock ourselves in a room and watch TV or internet or something. You've got to get out there. You've got to get out there and meet people and, uh, and, uh, and see people and interact. You know, it's just, we're just built that way. Okay, Cassie, we have another one here? I think that was the last one. Is that it? Okay. Well, mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at a lot of um, we're not just going to be looking back. We're going to be looking at modern things as well, too, as well, Tom. Um, we have some modern stuff that we some ideas we were discussing. Yeah. Um, what did you What did you think about the um, some, some What do you think about doing something modern? Maybe a walkthrough of Lawrence as it is now. Yeah, walkthrough. Uh, uh, then and now, again, reference point. Uh, then Points. and now. Mm -hmm. Because if you see where you've been and where you are now, you can start form a vision of the future. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of young people out there that are going to be building that future. And to build, you need a vision, a vision. What have you been working on lately? I've been um, working on my way up Broadway, of all things. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, from from Water Street again, where Fallon's used to be, and the Mills, and the and the um, Central Street Bridge, up to um, up to around where Bees was, and all the, the the side streets around there. And there is a little bit of a renaissance going on. There has been for a while now. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. once um, the urban renewal came in, that was like the low point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's had literally almost a generation since then mm -hmm. to come mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. and and it is coming back. We're going to be looking at the present Lawrence. We're going to be calling in some of our heavy guns, uh, our historical expert, Mr. Joe Bella. You've heard us refer to Joe quite a lot. We get a lot of ideas from Joe. Uh, Joe is a, 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 a really a walking archive of Lawrence history and history in general. And uh, he can tell us some great stories. So uh, Joe will be joining us. We're going to be doing a, a, um, a story on Thelma Todd, whom we mentioned in episode five. Thelma Todd, uh, born, raised in Lawrence, and um, she won a beauty contest here, and from here ended up in Hollywood. And in her brief short life, in 29 years, she did quite a lot. She was a, um, became a major Hollywood movie star. But as I mentioned in episode five, she had some bad company and um, fell into some trouble, okay, that we can only conjecture about. But we're going to call Joe in and have talk to Joe about it. I'd also like to do something on the strike of 1912. And Tom has told me, I didn't even know this, there was another strike in 1919 and apparently mm -hmm. another one in 1936. So no wonder Mr. William Wood of the Wool of uh, Mr. William Wood of the American Woolen Company 
packed up and left, took everything down south. Uh, that's what happened in the mills. First, they, they just couldn't pay the, there was a lot of competition, um, prices are going down, demands of the investors are going up. So they just took everything and moved it all down south. Uh, and the south was non-unionized, it was agricultural, people would work for less. And after they got up to speed, uh, they moved everything to Asia. Uh, and they constantly, the, the, the thing with about um, textile industry is nobody wants to have their kid work in a textile factory. I know, I did. My kid, and if the first the thing you take away from it is, I don't want my kid working in a textile factory. So they're only good for one or two generations, mm -hmm. and then they have to up and up. when people raise their standard of living, their education, they have to go constantly seeking uh, more uh, lower rung on the misery index. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunately the way it is. I think they're making textiles now in Bangladesh. Pretty soon, the the Bangladesh people will will, will outgrow it, and they'll, they'll find somebody else. Yeah, and it's the th the third most polluting, well, fashion, third most polluting industry in the world. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. That, that was just on I the no news idea. the other day. It's um. It must be the dyes. Number they three, use? the dyes uh, to make one pair of jeans, two thousand gallons of water. Oh my God! To produce one pair of jeans, I mean that's just the tip of the iceberg. But number three for pollution, plus. Um, must be solvents, dyes, mm -hmm. uh, treatments for cotton and wool. Yep. Uh, yeah, I can't even begin to imagine that. Um, but I'm, so, I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll fix those problems sooner or later as, as society progresses. So we're taking a look into the future. We have a lot of interesting things to talk about, a lot of interesting things to bring you. Also, I have a lot of historical uh, and movie stars Robert Goulet, as we we talked about Thelma Todd. Robert Goulet, uh, uh, very, very famous. Uh, Ferdinand de Mera, the great imposter. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was he was actually he was from Lawrence. And I understand his father was a projectionist at the palace. I didn't theater. know that. Yeah. He was the subject of a movie. How many people can say during my lifetime, I was a subject of a Hollywood movie. Well, he was. His Ferdinand de Mara, the great imposter, with Tony Curtis, his true story. He was an imposter, and of course, it was Robert Frost. So we have fertile grounds for um, a lot of um, a lot more um, subjects that we'll be talking about. So these streets have a lot of stories. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, with that, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Tom? Or? No, I think you I covered think, it. I think we've covered, covered all the bases. I think we've covered covered all the bases here, and uh, we want to thank the uh, Lawrence Historical Archives. We want to thank uh, HC Media, and I just want to say the people here are just so great. If you have a um, if you have any kind of uh, project you want to work on, um, they are just great great people to work with. So I can't say enough of them. So with that, I guess we'll, um, we'll sign off. And we'll hope to see you again with Lawrence Historical Project. Take care.